Oh, you've seen them on TV. They come out with that floppy, you know, leather-bound Bible. This is paper-bound. I don't have a leather-bound one. It's level. I'm jealous. You know, they come out, you know, and wave it in front of the congregation and read from it. And, you know, of course, in their traditions, Sunday worship is, is sort of an extended Bible study, is it not? These guys have a good 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Huh? In our own tradi tradition, St. John Chrysostom, how did he be the golden mouthed? Chrysostomos? Chrysostoma? Huh? Chrysostomos? The golden mouth. Well, how did he become the golden mouthed? Because he could preach for up to two hours. Two hours he would preach up to. Of course, this was before cell phones, this was before. Uh, the screens, the distractions, and Netflix, and that god awful, what is it now? That Washington football team that you have? Huh? huh? You, know, you know, you remember how I felt about it. Every other Sunday I'd say something, and you've actually accomplished the miraculous now. You've, you've gotten me to the point where I'm wistful for the way it was. How did you manage that? That is a miracle in itself, okay? Especially when I hear from some legitimate sources, I see some of them, okay, in the congregation, of the proffered new name, and I just want to laugh. It's so hilarious. How do you go from, you know, the, frying pan, the pot to the frying pan? I don't know, but I think it's hilarious, but in any event, I shouldn't. I shouldn't be so mean-spirited, should I? Anyway, it's just uh, vengeance is, is a, a dish best served up cold, say the Klingons. Anyway, uh, but two hours, St. John Chrysostom. If I go over a certain amount of time, I see it. I see it. I know all of you. Okay, you start to fidget, you start to go reach for your purses, you go with your hands in the pockets and stuff. If I tried to go two hours, I would be Papa Stivaiki, not the golden mouse, but the broken mouse. You'd throw things at me, okay? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. But, okay. So, I want today to be a, like, a little mini, I'm going I'm to exact my, my, my revenge. I'm, go I'm going to do a little mini Bible study here because today's gospel reading is so short. It's only eight verses. So, like we say in Greek, you know, I'm going to get it out of me once and for all. Okay, and then I'll, I'll be quiet for the rest of my priestly life. But I'm going to do a little mini Bible study here, eight verses. We'll go one verse at a time. And more importantly, I want to impress upon you how you should be reading the scriptures, okay? Not superficially, okay, but with intent. And most importantly, with what we call in the tradition, theocrisis, discernment. You should not be afraid to drill down. You should not be afraid to question. You should not be afraid uh, to inquire. Don't be afraid to be a petulant, you know, terrible two-year-old. Okay, all right. Don't be afraid to say, no, that doesn't make sense. Or, you know, is something else going on here below the surface of things? And so on and so forth. Remember the words of Origen and Clement of Alexandria and, and St. Gregory of Nyssa and others. We have to read the Bible with three eyes, not with two, with three with the eye of the flesh, meaning historically, what we see here, for instance, Jericho. Okay, that's a place. That's the eye of the flesh. Also, the eye of the mind, intellectually, but also, and most importantly, the noetic eye of the soul. Three eyes, not two. Yipon, let's, let's jump into it. Verse 35, then it happened as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. Okay, a big deal, right? How many, how many beggars have we read about in the New Testament, so on and so forth? Well, there's much more 
to this than just a blind man uh, sitting by the road begging. We have to, first of all, we register Jericho. What's Jericho? Jericho, 2,000 years ago, was not Jerusalem. It wasn't a major cosmopolitan center, but it was a substantial town or village. Okay? That's the first thing you have to keep in mind. All right? And we have to register in our minds that he was just outside the gates. Why was he just outside the gates? Because that's where most of the foot traffic was, right? People entering Jericho and leaving Jericho. So if you're blind and you have to remember, or, or you have some other disease or some other, some oh, disease, right? some, you're in some way, some way han have a handicap, okay? And we have to remember that we're talking about a time before the Department of Social Services, the Intervention for the Blind, the Center for the Blind, and so on and so forth. These people were left to the mercy of God. Even worse, in the ancient Hebrew tradition, they were thought of as somehow being outside of the grace of God, somehow cursed, because why else would they ha be blind or a leper or whatever? So they positioned themselves where there was the most foot traffic so that, let's say, one in a hundred travelers, okay, stopped to give them a shekel or a drachma or whatever it was. Well, if a thousand people passed by that way, a day, that was 10 shekels, or 2,000 people, that was 20 shekels. And they could somehow survive uh, their situation. Although, stop and think about it. Imagine being blind, being blind, and at the end of the day, you've got 10, 15, 20 shekels in your pocket, and now you're at the mercy of whoever is roaming about and who knows this, okay? The way we're going today, we may return to that situation. But that's a sermon for another time. I won't start that, okay? But we're talking about somebody who was in a horrific situation and who was trying to make the best of it. Okay, verse 36. In hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. Obviously, he couldn't see what was happening, but he could hear. And paradoxically, ironically, what's very fascinating here, what's very interesting, is that oftentimes the beggar, the blind person, okay, or whoever it may be, the, 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 the lame, the one that either could not see or could not walk or what have you, was oftentimes the clearinghouse of information because he was the guy who was there, listening, learning, you know, collecting information from the passers-by, and so on and so forth. So that's not immediately obvious as you read the verse. Verse 37. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Now, given what I just said, there's no, no doubt, there's no question that he had heard of Jesus. Jesus, after all, was the story, right? He was the story. His reputation, his, 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 his works, his miracles, his preaching, his, the way he was, the consternation that he was causing the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, all of this undoubtedly came to the hearing of the blind man. Verse 38, and he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now sometimes, you know, we read the New Testament and we know that Jesus is the son of David because of the tradition, because of the revelation and so on and so forth. But we have to ask ourselves, how did he know it? Right? How did he know that Jesus was the son of David? Because for the Jew, the son of David was the Messiah. So how did this blind beggar know that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, either he was convinced of it based on everything he had been told, 
okay, and given whatever knowledge of the tradition and the Hebrew scripture he had, or, and some of the fathers speak about this in their writings, or he possessed, he possessed spiritual insight. Just because his physical senses or his physical sense of sight was closed, this doesn't mean that his spiritual senses were not open. Oftentimes, unfortunately, okay, because we're such tuvla, we're such bricks and concrete blocks in our spiritual lives, all starting with me, okay, oftentimes it takes a crisis or it takes some sort of a breakdown or a closing, okay, for something else to open up. It's not necessarily so, but sometimes, it's like they say in the 12 steps, first you have to hit bottom, no, you don't. You don't have to hit bottom. You don't have to splat, but most do, okay? It's the same in, in our spiritual lives, brothers and sisters. So, he may have possessed spiritual insight. Verse, and, and, and uh, last thing on this. We are so busy, all of us, doing other things, okay, that we've lost or we persistently ignore our own insight. We all possess this insight because we're all still in possession of the image and likeness of God within. Okay, the light is there, but we ignore it because we're so busy looking outward and taking care of the things of this world which are important pay your mortgage, pay your taxes, do what you have to do, and what have you, but you can't ignore the inner life. And unfortunately, we do. And this renders us, brothers and sisters, spiritually blind. We gouge out our own eyes, okay? Unfortunately. Now, verse 39. This is where it really starts to get juicy. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on us. Have you ever considered that verse? It's awfully brutal, isn't it? Stop and think about it. The ones who went before, in other words, Jesus' entourage, his people, the ones that were accompanying him into Jericho. Okay? His staff, okay, told this blind beggar to be quiet. Whoa, okay? Put that in your, you know, your not yale, your, your water pipe and smoke it for a second. Think about that, okay? Where was their compassion? Where was their understanding? I mean, they're accompanying the number one healer in Palestine, and they're telling this guy to shut up. <laughs> there, are, there are always, brothers and sisters, the insiders. There's always the elite, okay? All right? Who bar access or try to control access because this is their way of retaining power for themselves. It's a sermon for another time again, but you know what I'm saying here. Okay, it's, it's, it's really tragic. There's always the Praetorian Guard. And thank God, uh, you know, uh, the Lord did not listen to them. One last thing on this. The Praetorian Guard supposedly is guarding the master, but what it's really doing is guarding its own self-interest. Okay, since time immemorial, since the tree in the, in, in the Garden of Eden. Ipon, we continue. So, he, the blind man, unperturbed. He kept crying out. So Jesus, verse 40, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come he, near, he asked him, Okay, so the Lord did not listen to his staff because the Lord always listens to us. 
directly to us. Verse 41, saying, now Jesus is, is asking him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Have you ever wondered about that? Why would he ask him, what do you want me to do for you? Wasn't it obvious what he wanted? Didn't Jesus know? That if, obviously he knew he was blind. Obviously he knew that he wanted to regain his sight. So why would he ask him that? that, that you know, why would he ask him that, my brothers and sisters? It's a very, very strange question. Well, there are a number of possible reasons. Number one, not all of us want to be healed. <laughs> okay, all present company accepted, of course, but we all know of folks who have made a career of being needy or want. You know what I'm saying. Now, I'm not talking about those with legitimate, absolutely legitimate uh, um, medical uh, conditions and so on and so forth, but there's just some of us who really don't want to be healed, okay? So this is perhaps one reason why he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? But there's something I think even more profound, which we will find in the next verse, verse 42. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. We've heard this before, right? Your faith has made you well. Well, what does that mean? Does this mean simply um, an intellectual affirmation? Yes, I believe that you're the Messiah. Yes, you're the son of David. Yes, 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 yes. Is that, is that it? Is that what, what the Lord means by that? And I would, I, would, I would ask you to remember last week's gospel and sermon, the 10 lepers. 10 were healed but nine, only one rather, only one was made whole. The other nine took off. Only one returned. So 10 were healed, but, on, but, but only one was made whole. And so the Lord is, is asking him here, what do you want? Do you want just to receive your sight? Or do you want to be made whole? Because there's a difference. Yes. You, uh, I'm going to give you your sight back, okay? But this doesn't mean that your soul is healed, that your soul is made whole. This doesn't mean that your spiritual eyes are reopened, just your physical eyes, so he's, uh, your physical sight. So he's asking him, what do you want? Because there's level one, and then there's level two. And level two is a stage development in, in an evolutionary order of, uh, of a much greater magnitude. And so, your faith, meaning your trust, your surrender, your restoration of your primary relationship with me is what's going to make you whole, not just receiving your physical sight. Because, because after all, your eyes are going to be open for the rest of your earthly life. And how long is that going to last? But if your spiritual eyes are opened, your spiritual eyes will be opened unto eternity. And finally, verse 40, 43. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. The operative words there, my brothers and sisters, of course, is and followed him, and followed him. So not only was he healed, he was made whole. This can be summarized thusly. And here I am borrowing from St. John Chrysostom, whom I revere, and I only wish I had the two hours that were allotted to him. I paraphrase, paraphrase in closing St. John Chrysostom. Looking at others with healed eyes 
Because how does all of this apply to us? Right? How does this apply to us? Oh, this is great, the blind man, Jericho, blah, blah, blah. But what does this mean for us today, brothers and sisters? Chrysostom. Looking at others with healed eyes, we see Christ in them. You can be blind and be given your sight back, and you, you see everyone and any, anything that you used to see, but do we see Christ in all people? Looking at others with healed eyes, we see Christ in them. Looking at ourselves with healed eyes, we see ourselves as God sees us. As God sees us. As his children, worthy of love, compassion, and healing. Amen. Please rise.